Tonight, we're going to kind of go through just uh, arthritis, and my colleagues will jump in and tell me to shut up and stop talking uh, because I tend to talk too much. But we're going to essentially get through a couple of these sections. The big things that I really want you to get out of it, what do different things look like? Um, you're going to find in the, you know, in the office that people are going to ask you to read x-rays a lot. So it's knowing what the features are of different arthritic processes and how to read those and then some basics of those processes. Arthritis is not terribly fancy, but it is something where the patho you know, fizz is a little bit different between those different types. So we wanna make sure we look at that a little bit. Um, so let's start with normal. So what is a normal joint? We can just do some native knee anatomy. Um, what we're really talking about is the chondral surface. You can see the ligaments um, both inside and outside. You all should know that the you know collateral ligaments are some are external to the knee joint, and obviously the cruciate ligaments are inside the knee. Which means that if they're floating around in whatever the gamish is that's inside of the knee, um, in a pathologic process like rheumatoid arthritis those ligaments might look a lot different based on the degenerative changes that have actually occurred. So those features can affect the meniscus, they can affect the cruciates, but this is kind of where we're starting from. This is kind of what normal looks like, a nice, smooth, healthy cartilage surface. It kind of looks like the surface of a cue ball usually, um, if it's healthy and smooth. And then we kind of go from there to the other thing, which is what it looks like when it's pathologic. So. The short end, and I invite my colleagues to jump in whenever they wish. Um, it kind of depends on what type of arthritis we're talking about. So if it's something that, if it's more osteoarthritis, it has some definite features. And then if it's rheumatoid arthritis, those features might be a little bit different. So I would ask that if you're looking at an x-ray, first of all, all of us are going to tell you to read the entire film. So in other words, Look at the rest of the x-ray and don't just get locked in on the knee joint because you're being asked to look at somebody who has knee pain. Look at the entire femur, the entire tibia. Um, do you have the right x-rays? Do you are, do you have orthogonal x-rays? So hopefully you know that orthogonal means you have it in two planes so you can see the joint in three dimensions. But look at the rest of the film. It's almost like how you learned how to read a chest x-ray earlier on in medical school that you look at the lung fields last and look at the rest of the bones and some of the other spaces before you actually get to that because it's the easy part. Same thing here. You don't want to look at somebody who's got an arthritic joint and then miss something that, you know, some of these other folks do do some oncology work. So some of my partners, you don't want to miss a goober in somebody's femur and then just blow it off. And it's actually something that could be um, pathologic. So look at the bone quality and look at the density of the bone. Does it look like it's washed out? Um, does it look like it's more dense than it should be? Look at the joint spaces. Look at the osteophytes. Are there osteophytes? Are there cysts? Is there sclerosis? And what does that all look like? And then, if, you know, think about what you can't see on a radiograph, like the meniscus and what those might look like. Are the cruciates absent? You know, that's more of a physical exam thing. And then stability. Um, you look at the alignment of the extremity on the film. Is it in varus? Is it in valgus? Is that way you can be very descriptive when you're reading a film for an attending. Is there anything else that you all like to see them say when they're reading a film for you? Is there things that I'm missing there that you like to throw out? No, you know, Matt, I think you brought up a few really good points. You know, I, I think, you know, any physician can read an x-ray and look at the skeletal structures, but it takes a really good orthopedic provider to look at everything, including the soft tissues. So I always encourage the med students not to just hone in on that pathologic finding of like joint space narrowing, to look at the whole picture and really give a start developing a, a very judicious rigor moral of reviewing an x-ray in a systematic fashion, commenting on the soft tissues. You can tell a lot about a patient's BMI, for instance, just by looking at an x-ray. And then, you know, in a very systematic way, describing the findings. So I, I, I do exactly what you do, uh, Matt. Um, but I think it starts uh, developing a routine, developing a, a systematic approach. Kara, is there anything that we missed there? That, anything else that you want them to look for or something they might want to comment on that you might see? Nothing to add, really. Um, you can look at bone qualities, like you said. Um, nothing really to add. Thanks. Okay. So let's kind of divide the two. So osteoarthritis, so usually the bone's going to be more sclerotic. It's usually going to be a little asymmetric, right? So it's not symmetrical joint space loss. 
So what does that mean? It's going to be, you know, more worn in one area than another. So usually, and these are going to be the ones where you're going to see more varus, more valgus, but in general, it's asymmetric. It's sclerotic. There are going to be osteophytes present. There are going to be some sclerotic areas, some cysts. And the final thing there is you don't need all those signs in order to make the diagnosis of osteoarthritis. In other words, if you don't see cysts or sclerosis, is it not osteoarthritis? Well, it probably is. It's just earlier on in the process where the patient hasn't really formed those. So those are your, you know, verbatim, you know, unique features for osteoarthritis. And, you know, the nice thing is that, I, you know, once you see the rheumatoid patient, it's kind of the opposite is the way that I think about it. But this is a nice x-ray. So you have, you know, a normal knee on the left, and then you have an advanced arthritic knee on the right, and you see all these core features. So first of all, when I'm reading this film, I'm looking at the bone quality. The bone quality looks fairly normal. It's not overly dense. It's not overly washed out. Um, if you have a chance, if you happen to see an x-ray on somebody who's like an amputee or a spinal cord patient, and you see that x-ray, that bone is going to look very washed out, very translucent almost, um, and it's going to have very different looking features. Um, here you see a normal joint space on the left and you see the wear that you have there. Now, sometimes that can be a little sneaky and that's why I say you want to make sure you look at a couple different views. Um, I find, and I'll, I'll ask the, my partners here, you know, what they think, but I find sometimes you'll see somebody's x-ray and in full extension, they look pretty good, but then you bring them into either a lateral where you can see the flexion space or you get like a PA flex view where their knees are slightly bent and all of a sudden that joint space that you thought was there suddenly disappears. Uh, because the flexion facet can be a little worn. So um, I always make sure that I get my standard views for a knee. I want, I would, first of all, want a weight bearing film. So I want them standing up. Um, I like to get an AP. I do like to get what's called a skiers or a PA flex view. I do like to get a sunrise view of the knee, which would be looking at the kneecap. And then I usually get a lateral. Um, so just realize that for any joint you're talking about, you want to make sure you get the appropriate set of films. So usually for me, for a knee, it's three or four views of the knee in order to see what I need to see. Any any other weird stuff that you guys get? Leg length films? Anybody big on leg length films on everybody? I do full length uh, hip to ankle films, but arguably that's not necessary. But Matt, I, I definitely do exactly what you do. I, I think weight bearing views are crucial. And then I do a flex PA view just to unmask some of that posterior femoral wear. Um, but I, I learned pretty early in practice, like the difference in joint space narrowing in some patients with and without weight bearing is pretty marked. So yeah. I think weight bearing views really helps you quantify in an accurate way, just the amount of uh, joint space narrowing. Yeah. And also it can tell you something about the ligamentous balance. Um, and when you look at these features, I find that one thing to practice that can really help you is not just looking at the x-ray, but then when you go and operate on these patients, try to correlate what you're seeing in the OR with what you're seeing on the x-ray. Um, you know, you'll notice, and then you'll notice, start to notice things like the fact that the lateral tibial plateau is actually uh, convex instead of concave, like the medial tibial plateau in patients without arthritis versus when you have arthritis, then, then, they're, then they're both concave, things like that. What does that osteophyte on the right, what does that actually look like when you open up the patient and they're looking inside? So you can start to correlate the findings on x-rays with uh, the amount of wear um, that you're seeing uh, grossly in the patient and, and get a sense of the range of what you're looking at. And usually the best thing to do when you all are reading films for us is read them to the point of boredom for the attending so that we can throw you the softball, which is, well, what do you think this is? What do you think is going on? And you can say, well, it's an osteoarthritic knee. So, you I mean, if you read it to the point of boredom, you're essentially showing us you know what you're looking at. Um, the other thing to comment on is obviously the alignment, varus, valgus. And Kara brought up an interesting point that, you know, the alignment can you know affect some of the things in the operating room. The more wide, so we get really hung up on how narrow the medial side of that joint is. Well, it's opened up on the lateral side because as they bear weight, it kind of stretches everything out on the lateral side, which as that gets to be more and more, that could mean I might look for the patient when they walk to have a thrust. And that means that I can actually see that tibia shuck outwardly as they hit the ground with their heel, which means that that knee's a little more unstable, which means it may be a little bit more difficult to deal with in the operating room. So those are just little things to look for when you're examining people. 
and, and Matt, we, we have one question from the audience, a very, very sweet one. So why, why is a sunrise view, view necessary and, and what do we glean from that view in particular? So I think a lot of times you'll have patients that will have, you know, an AP and lateral view and it will have, you know, next to nothing going on. And you'll have some of your younger patients. Um, I see a lot of women with uh, a lot of anterior knee pain. And it's the best way for me to get, again, an orthogonal view of that particular joint in this point, the, the patellofemoral joint. So I can actually look at that lateral facet because that's usually where they're going to have more wear. So you want to look at the same features. Do I have fights there? Do I have joint space narrowing? Do I have sclerosis? Again, I'm trying to document is there damage just to the patellofemoral joint. So it's a better way for me to look at that space. Sometimes also it does affect the treatment as well. So if someone has patel largely patellofemoral arthritis, I, we may get to this, but I'm not a... Um, I think physical therapy before surgery can be very helpful in terms of strengthening. I don't, I don't know that it's, I don't think it's very reliable in terms of relieving symptoms with the exception of patients with patellofemoral predominant arthritis. And those patients, for example, I'm more, um, I'm more likely to, uh, to give them, to try them on physical therapy to treat their symptoms before other interventions. Yeah, I'm a little more conservative with my patellofemoral folks for a while because I think, you know, the outcomes with what I do for a living with knee replacements and hip replacements, so with knee replacements for PF arthritis, the outcomes are good, but they're not great. And I think some of that is, you know, just based on the mechanics of the kneecap, but that's way beyond this. But yes, I think that you want to look at that because as Dr. Cipriano said, I mean, you want to probably max those people out with non-op treatment before you start fussing with them in the operating room. Um, causes of OA, pretty straightforward. It's usually a wear and tear phenomenon. Now, like wear and tear can be secondary to a lot of different things. It can be secondary to trauma. It can be infections. It can be a vascular necrosis. So that's something completely different. Or it could be something that falls in the developmental category like perthes or hip dysplasia or a slip capital femoral epiphysis, so a skiffy that a kid would have. Because all those things are going to affect the joint, the development of that joint, which then is going to have some downstream wear that if it's not treated, so our pediatric colleagues try to keep people away from me by intervening early on them to get the hips back in and deal with any kind of, you know, I'm thinking specifically in the knee about Blount's disease, trying to get those kids taken care of so that they don't have an arthritic joint and very early on in life. But it's a wear and tear problem. It's essentially just wearing out the tread on your tires. So what about the rheumatoid joints? So remember, we kind of had these features with an osteoarthritic knee so I want you to kind of be able to put those two in, you know, contrast. So the bone itself usually looks a little more osteopenic. So when you say osteopenia, what are you really saying? It's a little more translucent. It's less dense. So on the x-ray, it's going to look a little bit different to you. Um, maybe not at first, but as you look at more and more x-rays, it's going to jump out at you a little bit. And it's symmetrical joint space loss. So if you look at this x-ray that's on the right side of the screen, it literally looks like the cartilage just melted and the, essentially the two bones just came in contact equally. So it's symmetrical bones, bones, joint space loss as opposed to osteoarthritis, which was asymmetric. You don't see a lot of osteophytes, although there's a couple there, but you usually don't see a lot of osteophytes. You don't see a lot of cysts and you don't see a lot of sclerosis, okay? So it's a little bit different. Um, if you see osteophytes, does it you know, mean they don't have RA? Well, no, not really. I think some of these other features jump out at me a little bit more. If there's a little more osteopenia, it's a little more symmetric. I start wondering, and the reason why that makes all of us interested is if the patient doesn't have a rheumatologic diagnosis and you see those features, you might indeed want to have them worked up by rheumatology to see if they actually have something. Because again, if I intervene on somebody who has rheumatologic disease and actually get them on meds, you might prevent other joints from having this amount of damage. So it's, it's good to diagnose those people early. So if you start seeing those features, it should at least cross your mind. Is this something that's rheumatoid arthritis or a, what we would call a, a, a you know, essentially a syndromic arthritis. Matt, a couple things to add with that. Um, hey. The osteopenia is a, is a great feature to be able to pick up. Uh, for the diagnosis related to rheumatoid arthritis, but also for how you're going to handle the bone during surgery. Um, I find that one of the, the features that 
you can look for, if you go back um, a slide. I think I can do that. That uh, what you're, you're seeing the trabeculi actually more clearly um, mm -hmm. because you have demineralization. So what you're looking at is the scaffolding there. Um, so I find that helpful as opposed to, for example, you know, on the tumor side of things, looking at a ground glass lesion like fibrous dysplasia, it's a, it's a very different look where you're not seeing that scaffolding. It's the absence of the scaffolding. Um, and, and, and the other thing is that the x-ray features of rheumatoid arthritis may not be very pronounced. Someone can be quite symptomatic and have a, have a bad problem. But it's not going to. It may not look very dramatic on X-ray at all. And and then when you get to the operating room, you can really see that their problem was a lot of soft tissue inflammation, which is more the the nature of that disease process. So again, just something to keep in mind, like looking for those features. But if you don't see them, you know, not necessary. Don't necessarily write off that patient. Just understand that their pathology is very different. It's it's based, it's based in the soft tissues more, um, and, and you may not see that on x-ray. Okay. So where did, what's the pathoanatomy? So remember, this is from the synovium itself, right? So there's panis formation that actually causes this degeneration to occur at kind of at the edges. So it's usually bilateral, so there's symmetry to it, right? And it's periarticular soft tissue swelling. So it's not just the joint surface itself, it's the tissues around the joint. There's usually uniform joint space loss because there's this kind of erosive phenomenon that's occurring based on the patient's immunologic problem. Marginal erosion, you can see in the actual diagram to the right at the bottom, because what's actually happening is as that chronic inflammatory issue occurs, this is where some of the deformity that we used to see so in all honesty, you all probably have, you know, and this is going to make me sound really old, but some of the really horrible deformities that we used to see with rheumatologic disease, we don't see as much of anymore. So the next generation of physicians won't see it very much at all, unless it's somebody who literally didn't get treatment at all, because some of the meds are really good these days. But these erosive phenomena would cause some damage to the soft tissue structure, some of the ligaments and tendons and things around the joint in addition to the joint itself and cause some massive deformities. We don't see as much of that anymore, which is a good thing. But you see that, you do see some just juxtaarticular osteoporosis, which again is getting at the bone quality. And then again, the subsequent deformity that can occur. Like Dr. Cipriano said, um, again, you may not see somebody with these horrible, you know, changes and some of these horrible, I'm showing you kind of bad x-rays, but you may not actually see those bad x-rays as much. So you may have somebody with somewhat mild appearance and have a lot of symptoms because again, there's a soft tissue issue with a lot of inflammation associated in and around those joints. So the other thing to ask patients when you're in the room is, do you have any other joints that you have pain with? You're here to see somebody about your knee or your hip, but how about your you know, small joints in your hands, your feet, your ankles, you know, where, where is it? You know, the other thing is family history, right? Do they have first degree relatives in there that have been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis? It's a simple question to ask and they may give you the answer right there. So just things to kind of think about anything that anything else that I'm missing there, I'm kind of throwing in some history things. Yeah, Matt, you know, I think you brought up one of the, the most important points. You know, I, I think as, as orthopedists, we, we're, we get into this notion of, you know, seeing an x-ray, treating it immediately with surgery, high-fiving your patient on the way out. Um, but you know, it's, it's important to not skip the basics and the history for rheumatoid arthritis, I think is paramount, you know, asking about polyarthralgia, asking about a family history, asking about multiple warm, hot joints. Those are things that can really help point the surgeon in the right direction, especially when there are radiographic features of overlapping osteoarthritis. So I, I think that's a great point. And I think that's something that, you know, as we advance in our training as orthopedic surgeons, we sometimes skimp on the history, but for rheumatoid uh, I think it's an important aspect of their, uh, their workup. So we're talking about a TNF alpha pathway and I don't want to, you know, bore everyone with the, the, the patho anatomy, but it's a synovial driven disease. Um, you do get kind of all the downstream from the overaction of this particular molecule. And that's why a lot of the meds that have come out are, you have TNF alpha inhibitors. There's some, 
newer ones that are actually probably a little bit better because they target the pathway a little bit better. But um, when you're talking about most of the meds, you're talking about going after TNF alpha. So, but this is kind of your, you know, your primary agent of evil, so to speak, when it comes to rheumatoid arthritis. What about crystalline arthropathies? So if you haven't taken call with a, a resident yet, or you're about to, um, at least once a night, you will get a call about a hot joint. And the question is always, is it an infection or is it, a, is it gout? Um, it can look all, for all the world like septic arthritis, right? It, it's a hot, swollen joint. It's red. It's irritated. It's quite painful. Um, usually it boils down to we get some inflammatory markers, but usually at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're putting a needle into the joint to pull some fluid out uh, to send that for evaluation. Um, gout. We're talking about traditional gout uh, and negatively bifringent uh, crystals. I think birefringent, perfect. I did spell it right. Uh, Monosodium urate crystals. Try and say that three times fast. Um, but that's important because that's testable. Um, Pseudo gout is positively bifringent calcium pyrophosphate crystals. They look different. The gout crystals on an X ray, and again, this comes up sometimes on tests, are more needle like. Um, they are usually yellow on the, on the slide, um, but they look like literally like needles. The pseudo gout are a little bit more rhomboid shaped. They're usually a little bit more blue. Um, but it's just something if someone were to show that, but uh, in all intents and purposes, clinically, they look very similar. Um, you would only pick that up after you actually look at it, um, uh, in the lab. Uh, you can get um, meniscal uh, deposition on radiographs. You can see some calcium deposition into the meniscus sometimes. Um, that is not. That means you could have that or could have had that at one point or another. Sometimes that's a natural process of just having an arthritic joint is that you can get a little wear and tear to the meniscus and it calcifies a little bit. Um, but the diagnosis is based off of aspiration. You do not need to have all the signs of a gouty joint to make the diagnosis of gout. Um, but the priority obviously here, um, and again, I invite my colleagues to, uh, to jump in, but you have to know if it's a septic joint or not. So this becomes a more urgent consult for the resident and for you. So if you're getting a specimen, usually your job is to get it to the lab as fast as possible because if it's gout, you're going to treat it non-operatively with some anti-inflammatories and then dealing with the uric acid issue. And if it's an infection, you're taking them to the operating room. So you, you want to know what this is pretty quick. Any other thoughts or anybody? Let's keep moving. So here's your picture. So you got your monosodium urate crystals. Again, look a little bit more yellow. Um, they're needle-like on the left. And again, calcium pyrophosphate crystals with pseudo gout on, on the right which are more rhomboid, a little bit more blue on the slide. But I swear to you, they will use the same clinical slides over and over again. I think I've seen diagrams and slides of path that have been used for about 150 years um, that will keep coming up. And these are probably ones that you'll see again. So just commit that to memory. Causes. Um, so gout itself was used to be known as the King's disease, right? So it's usually dietary, high protein diets. Um, ur urate is the end product of purine metabolism. So people that drink a lot of wine and have a little too much red meat, amongst other things, can get this. Um, as your serum urate levels rise, you reach a level where it's no longer soluble and then that just crystallizes in the tissues. And it can go subcutaneous, but it likes to jump into joints quite a bit. Uh, the most um, um, traditional one is usually in the first MTP. Um, so people call you and they'll say they got a sore toe. Um, but hyperuricemia is, uh, either overproduction or under secretion. So, but that is usually the most traditional way they'll ask you on, on a test, um, is usually it's in a toe. Um, here's your x-ray. Um, it's very common in the first MTP joint. You can see it's kind of an erosive arthropathy where it's kind of swollen and again to get it nate's point that he made earlier look at the soft tissues around on the x-ray you can see that that is swollen to beat the band around that first uh, mtp joint um so that soft tissue shadow is very swollen and it's got almost a little bit of a cloudy appearance to it so there's something almost like mineralization 
in the soft tissues. And then you can see some erosion around the joint itself. So it gives it away. Now, the problem is, I don't know if that's an infection or if it's gout, because um, they can have similar features on x-ray. So again, what do you end up falling back to? It's an aspiration usually. Um, so usually you end up kind of going in, getting some fluid out, sending the lab kind of rule it out. And it happens a lot. That's point about ruling things out. You want to be very careful to maintain a high uh, suspicion in patients who have a history of gout, but for whatever reason, there's some feature about this incident that is different from their previous flares. So whether it's a different location um, or, or something is unlike it, then, then you really, uh, then you do need to be careful. A lot of patients who've had gout, they understand what their gout flare feels like. And if they can tell you reliably that it always happens like this and I take this and it gets better, um, then you're, you are uh, probably going to be less inclined to tap it. But, uh, but otherwise, um, especially so, you know, anyone with a monoarticular process going on that is different from their previous gout experiences, you have to be very uh, careful. The realist in me would tell you that you're probably better off aspirating the joint if you're at all concerned for two reasons. Number one, it gets the diagnosis quicker, but number two, it allows you, and this is selfish, it allows you to go to bed um, because otherwise you're rechecking that patient. Is the exam worse? Is there something else going on? Um, you're better off just getting the definitive diagnosis quickly because then you can put things to action, so to speak. Um, usually hemming and hawing buys you nothing but anxiety and making you lose sleep. So you're better off just kind of treating this. So what's the pathology? Well, we talked about it. You have hyperuricemia. You then have the precipitation of those crystals into the joint. And then essentially you kick off this inflammatory cascade, which uh, I've long since forgot, but essentially you get essentially some lysosomal enzymes start to beat up the joint. So what do we try and do? You, you try and treat the underlying pathology, which is you try and get the, the urate levels down, which a lot of the medications that we prescribe people are designed to actually, you know, take your uric acid level and drop it down. Now, acutely, what do we do for these people? You get the inflammation to calm down. You'll notice that you're seeing the same sort of pathways that you see with the rheumatologic disease. You're seeing these inflammatory factors like IL-1, TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-8, such so your immune system's kicking up its inflammation. So what do you give people? You give them anti-inflammatories and, you know, instead of antibiotics, right? So if we can get somebody to get some anti-inflammatories and, and once you get those started, typically the, the acute symptoms will calm down, but then you need to deal with the underlying pathology, which is the second step, which is get the uric acid level down, which is usually not something we're doing. It's something we're usually asking our medicine colleagues to take care of. Okay. History taking. So here's a patient with right knee pain, 58 year old guy uh, comes in with left knee pain, got some swelling effusions. What, what is an effusion? So I just always like to, cause we throw around terms. Fusion means palpable fluid in the joint. So how do we figure that out? Well, sometimes you put their knee all the way, at least with the knee, you pull it all the way out straight if they can straighten it out. And then you'll kind of collect the fluid is kind of the way I think about it. You want to feel is that, you know, kneecap bouncing around in there because it feels like it's floating in a water balloon. Um, sometimes it can be slight like mine does right now from moving boxes in my house. Um, there's a little bit of fluid in my knee, which is not good. Um, is there bowing? Is there deformity? Look at people, you know, watch them walk, make them, if they can get up and walk for you, watch them walk, whatever their complaint is. Um, see if there's a deformity, is there instability? Now, if you ask a patient, are, is your knee unstable? Why, my definition of unstable and the patient's definition of unstable are two different things. If I ask the patient if they're unstable, they may mean that they feel like it goes out from underneath them. It gives out on them. And it could be specifically when they're climbing stairs. So you might want to ask them, when does that happen? What are you doing when that occurs? Um, my definition of stability is really thinking about ligaments. So you want to be careful when you say they feel like their knee's unstable. Well, what do you mean by that? So when you clarify those sorts of things, that's part of the history taking. 
stiffness? Does it bend? What's your range of motion? So make sure when you're talking to people that you use terms that they actually understand. Um, you know, if you talk to them about stiffness or feeling like it's going to give out or specific activities that they're having trouble with, that's probably going to be a little better. Um, even with deformity, as I'll ask them if they've always had bowed legs. That makes a difference for me for some of the stuff that I do. Um, those sorts of things can be helpful when you're starting to plan other you know, aspects of care. The point about instability is, is really important. I mean, a lot of patients, when they say that the leg buckles and gives out, um, it, it's a, it can be lead you down a totally different treatment path because to me, that signals quad weakness, quad weakness. That's the number one cause in my mind of the leg giving out. So I'm going to send them for physical therapy if their major complaint is instability from the leg buckling. Um, whereas if it's, if it's instability in the way that we think of it, it's a different map. All right. I'm getting prompted to move my pace along. My, the boss lady's telling me I got to move. So history, where it is, you know, what do you want to know? So again, get in and out of the room. Don't take forever. You know, my patients, I got a lot of older folks. They love to talk to me, but you, you got to get kind of, it's like, you know, it's an old TV show. It's called Dragnet. It's just the facts. Like, tell me where it is, how often it happens, where it's the intensity of the pain. Um, what have you tried? So ask them about injections. Ask them about medications. You know, if sometimes the, the one that always trips you all up is you will say, you know, do you take any, you know, anti-inflammatories? Well, yeah, I tried ibuprofen and it didn't work. Well, how often did you take it and how many did you take? Because if you took two of them one time and it didn't work, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to work. So just make sure you kind of check the frequency and the amount that they're taking. Um, physical exam. So all. So for me, you know, be, first thing is be gentle. Uh, number one, if you were examining somebody who recently had their hip replaced, now is not the time to check their range of motion. Uh, I have had a medical student dislocate a hip in clinic. Um, you just want to be careful that you're not that person. Um, always examine the hip when you're asked to look at someone's knee. Sometimes my knee arthritis patients will present with knee pain and you get an x-ray and their knee looks completely normal. And then you go in and you just have to just internally and externally rotate their hip when they're in the seated position. And you may find that that generates the symptoms and you may suddenly be getting a hip x-ray. You look really smart as the student when you come out and say, they're here for a left knee issue, but their left hip's pretty stiff and we probably need a film. You'll look like a stud. So that's where you want to go. So just remember hip disorders can present as ipsilateral knee pain. Have them walk. Look at their gait. Is it antalgic, which just means painful? Do they have a thrust? Again, does that tibia look like it's shifting outwardly or inwardly as they bear weight? So it implies more stability. Are they using anything to walk with? What are they using to walk? Is it something they use all the time or is it just because they're in the office with you? Do you have swelling? Do you have effusions? We talked about that. Check active and passive range of motion. Um, one of the big ones is I like you guys to know the difference between a flexion contracture and extensor lag. Those are two important terms. A flexion contracture means both actively and passively, I cannot straighten my joint. So if we're talking about a knee, I can't fully extend my knee, whether you do it or I do it for you on exam. An extensor lag means that when I passively bring their knee up, I can bring them into full extension. They come all the way straight. And then when I ask them to do it, they can't quite straighten that leg out all the way. And that could be a problem with their extensor mechanism. It could be quad weakness. There's a lot of different things. But you want to make sure you know the difference between a lag and a contracture. Palpate the area of interest and then do a ligamentous exam. Check your collaterals, do a, your nice sports exam and check the cruciates to see what it is. But again, in this population, be a little more gentle. They don't need to have their joint horked on because they're going to be sore. We already talked about imaging. So in nor normal AP radiograph of the left knee. Again, it's a standing film. Um, I make a big point that how the hell do you know if it's standing? Every institution does it a little bit differently and how they mark if it's a weight-bearing x-ray. This one you can kind of see in the bottom left corner does say weight-bearing. Sometimes it'll just be a little arrow that's pointing upwardly. 
which means that they were bearing weight. Sometimes they'll have a little, uh, I don't know if I have it in this slide, but they'll have a little marker that has a bunch of BBs in a cup and the BBs will fall all to the bottom of the cup if they're standing up. If they're laying down, the BBs fall to the bottom of the cup and the BBs all sit in the middle. So the point is make sure you know what you're looking at. Make sure that you know it's a weight bearing x-ray or not, because that could change your diagnosis. Here's a normal lateral radiograph. And again, now you're seeing the patellofemoral joint a little bit. And you're also seeing some of the posterior knee, which shows you more osteophytes. And then here's your classic sunrise view. And again, we asked the question earlier, why do you get this view? Well, you get a better look at the patellofemoral joint. You can see here that the PF joint is completely crushed. There is no joint space. There are a lot of osteophytes. So again, if I see this x-ray, and I would encourage you all, if you have the opportunity to look at the x-ray before you walk in the room, look at it so you kind of know in your head what you might see. This patient might say, I have medial joint pain. They might say lateral, which would throw you off. They might say, it's really in the front, and I notice it a lot when I go up and down the stairs. I feel like my knee's going to go out from underneath me. I'm going to have more instability, okay? So just kind of know what you might see and what the patient might say before you walk in the room. And then you can get a long leg film. And I don't know if that came in. There you go. So you can get a three foot film, uh, which gives you the axis of the extremity. If anybody tells you that you can see the axis or the amount of varus or valgus in a joint accurately on a you know film that just a normal knee film, that's pretty tough. Um, you really want to know if you look and do exactly what we did in this x-ray, which is you drop a plumb line from the hip to the ankle, and then you can see that this knee is in a significant amount of valgus, okay? If that plumb line falls medial, it's a varus knee, and if it's lateral like this one is on the right, it is a valgus knee. Here's the little shot about the weight bearing. This is just something that drives me crazy, and i like you all to know it. Um, it can say weight bearing on the film. It can be an arrow pointing up, or there can be these little BBs. Now, the picture I put at the bottom was a little graphic that I drew. This is how they did it at our place. Again, you can imagine it's a cup with three little metal BBs in it. If the BBs fall to the bottom, it's falling with gravity, so that's weight bearing. And if they all stay in the middle of the cup, it's a non-weight bearing film. So let's get into diagnosis and treatment because this is more fun. So the non-op stuff is usually the stuff that you guys will spit out that we want you to spit out before we start talking about the fun stuff that we get to do. But usually this is what you honestly want to start with. You don't want to be pushy with surgery. I tend not to be pushy with trying to talk patients into it because then I start feeling like, you know, a used car salesman, which is not why, the way that I want to live my life. You want them to make the decision. So you give them options for treatment. And the options on the front end are to max out NSAIDs. Again, which one are they taking? How much of it did they take? How often do they take it in a day? Um, sometimes you'll ask them if they're taking that and they'll say, yeah, I take Tylenol. Well, Tylenol is not an NSAID. The other thing is, can they take them? If they can't, why not? Do they not tolerate it? Um, is it something that they have as far as their medical history? They have some cardiac issues. They have some kidney problems. Um, those are all things that are going to make a difference. Weight loss, assist devices, activity modification. So when we talk about that, as far as what types of things can we take out? So for the, my two partners in crime tonight, what do you talk to them about as far as activity modification? What do you want them to get rid of? You know, what do you try to encourage them to get away from? You know, Matt, oh, sorry, Kara, you can go first. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, I, I make it pretty patient dependent, depending on their exacerbating factors. But I think the two common denominators that I found are for, particularly for knee osteoarthritis are uneven surfaces and then anything that's even remotely high impact. So I asked them, asked them to give up those two things. And then there's a second tier of, of patients that are unable to ascend and descend stairs and avoiding those types of things as much as possible can also go a long way to help stave off surgery, especially if someone's not, not fit for a haircut. I think that the impact is, is what I talk about mostly. Um, and, uh, like Nate said, very important. And I, you often have to explain to patients what impact means. So the way I explain it is anytime your foot loses and makes contact again. So as an example, a treadmill is impact an elliptical is not a bike is not 
Walking is low impact technically, but certainly not as much as running and jumping. And so if you explain it to them that way um, and give them options about, you know, just because you don't want to tell them stop exercising, but, um, you know, swim, you know, if you can't run, walk, if you can't walk, swim, you know, <laughs> try the bicycle um, and, and really work with them to figure out what's going, what's going to work with their life, because ultimately we're here so that they can continue the living the active life they want to live within reason. So it's activity modification, not cessation of all activity. And I think that's an, an important point. And I think the game also is that when we're thinking about these people operatively, that same activity issue comes into play because we're talking about implants that have a certain life expectancy and they have wear. So if you have somebody who's in a high demand job or they're going to pound on it, they're a younger patient. You know, the classic test question always says you're a heavy laborer, which means that, you know, you, you have to throw and you're hauling stuff and you're pounding on your knee. That's not going to be a really great situation on a great patient to do a knee replacement on or a hip replacement because it's not going to last that long. It's not going to have the same track record for survival um, in that versus somebody who works a desk job. Um, so those types of activity modifications also come into uh, play when you're talking about surgery and the person's employment. Um, treatment, arthroscopic treatment is probably only really necessary for people that have mechanical issues. So folks that have a symptomatic flap of cartilage or something where they feel a clunk, a click, a clut, where they get stuck um, and it's pretty focal, um, that may help. But you have to really tell those patients that that may deal with that, that click or clunk, but it's really not going to do a great job getting rid of their symptoms in total. Um, osteotomies, so it's kind of a forgotten art to a certain extent, changing the axis of the extremity. So you just saw a three foot film. If you think you could about trying to shift the axis of that extremity so they bear more weight in this picture in the medial portion of the joint where it's not as beat up, that could be helpful because you're using their joint. You haven't replaced anything. You're essentially just shifting this axis to a healthier portion of the joint. That's always a treatment option. You could fuse it. So you get rid of the joint. So you remove the joint and allow the two bones to grow together. And then if there's no friction and no movement, there's no pain. You can consider what I do, which is partial and full arthroplasty. So full and you know, total knees, total hips, or partial um, knees. And those can be helpful. So, you know, when we get in, I don't want to get bogged down in this, but again, you know, we talk about non-op treatment. We're talking about NSAID use. You do have to know about, you know, your COX-1 versus your COX-2 inhibitors. We do still use Celebrex a lot for patients that don't tolerate COX-1 inhibitors. I will use a topical anti-inflammatory for patients that have gastritis, especially for knees or elbows, things that are more um, uh, superficial joints. Um, it works pretty well. So there are, a, there are topical anti-inflammatories that people can use. So if you have somebody who just has stomach issues, that's one thing. Um, even your cardiac patients, most of the cardiologists won't get terribly uppity about giving somebody a topical anti-inflammatory to use. Um, but for patients that have renal disease, Sometimes you can't use those things. So you want to know why they can't take it um, because that can change what you use. Aspirin, you notice, is in that list. Aspirin is a great anti-inflammatory. The problem is that it's also a you know, nasty blood thinner, and it only has a half-life of about four hours. So it doesn't last that long. There are others in that list that have a longer half-life um, that would probably be better. So you want to make sure you kind of steer people in the right direction. And also kind of find out how much people are taking because sometimes they're taking too much and they can have some downstream effect. PT, you've heard a, a couple of us comment on that already. Doing therapy for these folks can be helpful. Um, it can be good for folks for range of motion. It can good, be good for strength um, because most of the time, if you have an arthritic joint, you lose strength in that extremity in that area. So if we're talking about a knee, it's your quad. If we're talking about a hip, we're talking about your abductor muscles or your glutes, um, but it can help with strength and gait, and it can help with balance. Um, and I think especially for these older folks, um, that can be particularly helpful. And for folks that you're thinking about throwing them into the operating room, 
it's sometimes helpful to get them used to being a little bit more active because you're going to ask them to do a little bit more rehab after they have that joint replaced. So you want to make sure they can be up and moving around. Kara, do you have a comment? Oh, just that I really think it gives them a jump start, both in terms of strength and knowing what, what to do, especially for older patients who may be a bit more deconditioned or may not absorb as much in that first day or two post-op when therapy is working with them in the hospital. Um, it's good for them to have, have these patterns ingrained before you operate on them. Gate aids. I think, you know, this is something we don't talk about as much, right? Um, bracing, I didn't throw in there, um, but sometimes something as simple as a compression sleeve can be helpful just to give them a little bit of extra support. I tend to stay away from things that are bulky as far as that have hinges and things of that nature because then I think it's just too hard for people to deal with. Making sure the person uses that gate aid, specifically a cane, you want it in the hand opposite of the joint that's symptomatic. So if it's your left side, your left knee or your left hip, you actually want it in your right hand. The real problem is when it's right-sided because most of the population, I think it's what, 85, 15? It's only 15% of the population is left-handed. Um, so if it's a right-sided issue, most people want to still put the thing in their right hand because it's their dominant hand. So you need to make sure you instruct them that they're using it in the appropriate hand. So you usually want it opposite. Um, so And you want to know what they're using and how much they use it. Um, arthroscopic treatment, again, not a huge amount of value there for somebody who's an arthritic joint. It's probably only really indicated in the patient if they're having mechanical symptoms. So if you have a patient that's a little bit older, they have some arthritic signs on x-ray, but these are, their symptoms are different. They'll say, I know I have that, but now I'm noticing that I can't, I've, I've had trouble where my knees locked or it catches, or I can't fully extend it. And then I kind of move it around and then it gets better. They may have a loose body or something else in there. Again, for that particular targeted issue, that scope might help quite a bit for that locking and catching, but it's probably not going to help them a lot with their overall pain. And you need to make sure they understand the difference between those two sets of symptoms. Um, but that's what you'll see sometimes for folks. Fusion. So what are we doing? We're essentially roughing up the bone. So getting the cartilage on the ends of the bone and removing it so that you have essentially rough bone where you have bleeding bony surfaces. Bone is going to just try and heal to bone. So again, if you put those two surfaces in contact and oppose them, and just like any fracture talk you've ever heard, if you put some compression across that surface and you stabilize it, what happens? Well, it grows together. It will ease pain because there is, again, no movement in that joint. However, the problem is, is that when you do fusions, that can be functionally very limiting. If you think about it, if you're just sitting at a desk right now watching this talk, if your leg was locked out straight and you try to get into a car, <clears throat> that's pretty difficult. Or ride a bus or, you know, lots of different things where your knee is out and it's just kind of stuck straight. Just sitting in a chair for dinner in a restaurant or in a booth. That could be hard, um, not to mention that it does increase some of the forces elsewhere to be able to walk. So it's going to cause you some ipsilateral um, hip problems, and you can have some ankle issues as well. Um, but it is, so it's a little more functionally limiting, but it is a pain relieving procedure. Um, and it's an alternative to an amputation um, in some infection cases. Um, yeah, I think but that, that, sorry, Matt. The, no, the classic indication for a fusion is infection with extensor mechanism disruption. So if you if your extensor mechanism is out and you're you know you and that's all that's the only problem you can reconstruct that. Um, but if you're infected as well and don't want to put a lot of graft and so on, and the the chances of that working go down quite a bit. So. In that case, a fusion is often considered. Uh, I would agree with Matt that fusions are generally not very well tolerated. And, um, you know, I, I, I find that in a lot of situations, patients are actually happier if they have an amputation than if they have a fusion. So obviously something to discuss with the patient um, quite a bit. But it is it does make life harder. And if, if they have trouble getting around, 
uh, before this operation, they will probably have more trouble after it. Yeah. We, we have a question from the audience. Um, you know, the question uh, is about steroid injections. So if steroid injections work well to treat degenerative joint disease of the knee, how long uh, do we typically use them before we start worrying about irreversible damage to the adjacent soft tissues like tendons, ligaments, and so forth? I always think this is a, this is kind of like a chicken and the egg question, right? So, I mean, you're not really injecting steroid to try and preserve anything that's going on in the joint. Um, and that's the short answer is that, you know, what you're really doing is just trying to knock down the environment so it's less inflamed, right? So, there are studies that are out there that show that you can actually have soft tissue injury associated with long-term steroid exposure. Most of the time you're not talking about at the same doses that most of the studies were thrown at, you know, throwing at the tissue um, because we're not doing continuous infusions of steroid, you're, you know, so most of us have kind of a, a threshold phenomena. So when I inject somebody, it's based on the response. Uh, honestly, if somebody's getting less than, you know, a couple months of relief, it's probably not worth it to keep exposing them to steroid. Steroid is not benign. Um, it's better than throwing oral steroids at someone where they're going to see that stuff systemically because it's more targeted. Uh, but we know that your body still sees some of that, right? Your diabetic patients do have a spike in their blood sugar. Um, you do need to tell your diabetic patients that they could have that trouble. You probably shouldn't inject two joints. I don't know how everybody else feels. I, I get really leery of injecting more than one joint on a diabetic patient in any one sitting. I like to give them a little time between the shots um, because you do see that spike in the blood sugar. But I think, you know, yes, if you were chronically doing it, you know, every week and injecting somebody's knee, which would be a little silly. Yes, you could see some of those phenomena, but not not if I'm doing it every three, four or five months. Um but again, it's a chicken and the egg argument. That cartilage and that soft tissue environment is already damaged by the process that's there, you know, the arthritic process. The steroid is there just to knock down the symptoms for a period of time for somebody who maybe doesn't want to have surgery. Um, we talked about osteotomy. Uh, These are just two pictures. You see the top right is what's called a high tibial osteotomy. What you're really doing is kicking the tibia into a more valgus position. Why would you do that is to get the weight bearing axis again to fall into the lateral compartment, which is going to help essentially offload a, an arthritic medial side. Now that's important that you need to know that the lateral side is actually okay. You can't do an osteotomy if the lateral side is also arthritic. So if you're offloading it to an arthritic portion of that same joint, it doesn't really help the patient, but you can see what you're really doing is putting a wedge like a shim that you would put in a door, essentially crack open that joint. So, What's the downside? Well, you can you can have some other problems where you can have fracture, you can have implant failure. You you have to keep them off of it for a period of time. The one that you see in the bottom is a, a distal femoral uh, osteotomy. Essentially, what it's doing is kicking them into a more varus position to offload the the lateral side of the joint in a more valgus issue. So it'd be a varus producing distal femoral osteotomy, offload the lateral knee. But you can do this for a younger patient who's more active that you don't want to do an arthroplasty for, um, but it's often a stepping stone surgery, right? It's our way of buying, you know, six, seven, eight years of time where they don't have an arthroplasty, hopefully getting somebody into their 50s so that you could then think about a joint, okay? You can talk about doing arthroplasty procedures and, you know, again, it's selecting, you know, is it uni versus total? So when we talk about uni, we're talking about doing one portion of the joint. You want to be careful that when you say that in clinic that you're talking about, you want to say medial or lateral uni compartmental. You also have to remember that there are, you know, some folks out there still doing um, um, patellofemoral replacements so they can have what's called a PFJ or a patellofemoral joint replacement where we're only replacing the patellofemoral joint. Um, so you want to basically select the procedure based on where is their pain, where is the damage, and what are the patient's expectations for activity, and what are they bringing to the table? What's their health? What's their BMI? What's their range of motion? Are they a diabetic? Um, all these things are going to have some impact on the decision. What's the underlying pathologic process? I'm not going to do a uni for a patient that has rheumatoid arthritis. That's a huge no-no. 
because you know that that pathology affects that entire joint. So you wouldn't just want to replace the part that you can see because that is kind of a possibility that the rest of the joint could fall apart at some point and you did no, no service and you should have probably done a full knee replacement.